And our next speaker is Rafael Franca. He comes from Brazil and he's one of the most vibrant Rails contributors, the most frequent Rails release manager, and also known as the Rails patch monster. So he works at Shopify and he will tell you about sprockets. Hello everyone, I'm here to talk to you about how Sprockets works, but first I want to know how many of you knows how Sprockets really works. So please raise your hand if you know how that works. Oh, we have two, three? I think three people knows how that works. That does not include me because I don't know anything about it. So yeah, that's not true. Uh, but I'm not the original maintainer of the project. So this project, project was created by Josh Peake in San Stephenson from Basecamp originally. And since the last year, Josh left the project and no one in the Rails call knew how this project works. So this talk is exactly my try to understand how this project works and to show you in the community how it works originally. So like it was said, I'm Rafael França. It's hard to say my last name. So you can find me in GitHub as Rafael Franca and Rafael Franca also in Twitter. I'm a member of the Rails Call team and I work at Shopify. So one thing that I really like about the Rails Call team is that we are allowed to work in anything that we want to work. So some people like to do interesting and exciting things like implementing new features and also make performance improvements. But to people be able to do that, someone had to do the hard and boring job. So I am the person that do that boring job. So I can say that I'm the Rails maintainer. Like it was said, I was the release manager of the last three years and I'm always dealing with issue trackers and reporting and reviewing pull requests. And not just in the Rails repository itself, but the Rails project has a lot of different components that you can, most of you already are familiar with them, like Action View, Action Controller, Active Records, but we also have things, Rails is present in all the layers of your web development framework, like you have things at the process level, like Spring, we, you have the MVC stack framework, you have things running in the browser that are part of the Rails project, like jQuery, JS, and Turbolinks, and you have the assets pipeline, that is what I'm going to talk to you today. So this is, uh, is the agenda of this talk. First, I need to, to tell you why do you need the asset pipeline and what that means. What are the changes possible for the asset pipeline inside the Rails? How it works in a Rails application and how to extend it? So first, why do we need the asset pipeline? Before the Rails 3.1, we Rails had no conventions how to organize your assets. Apart from that, you already knew how to organize a Rails application. You have folders like app models, app controllers, but all the assets in that time were put in the public folder. So there were no convention in that time in how to organize assets. And usually you end up with a lot of files that you don't know even if they were be used or not in your application. And also in that time, you had to do some trade-offs between code organization and performance. Like, should I use small self-contained files that's better for modularity and maintenance of the code, but it also create more requests to the, from the browser to the web server, so that could cause better worse performance in your client side. 
So should I take this way or should I make few assets requests, like maintaining one reuse file that is hard to maintain and also the reuse components? Or the trade off that were common in that age was should I write legible code with the executive name and code documentation? Or should I send a few bytes to the users so the connection will work faster and you can get your page faster? And also in that time we have, you had new technologies being used like CoffeeScript SaaS and recently ES6. So to solve all those problems, we introduced the Rails access pipeline and how it's working right now in Rails. So now we have conventions for the assets. All the assets live in the app assets folder. So you have folders for style sheets, you have folders for JavaScript, you have folders also for images. So it's easy to know where each component of your client side is present and you, you can also have assets inside the lib and vendor. And the assets are compiled on the fly in development and need to be pre-compiled in production. Apart from that, Sprockets also set good standards like you are able to cache out your assets in the client side for forever and Sprockets will be able to do cache bursting, setting a uh, digest in the name of the assets itself. Now that you already know how the assets pipeline works in Rails, I'm going to talk about the genes that are responsible for this behavior. So we have several genes that make this possible. Sprockets, Sprockets Rails, Size Rails, ExactJS, and Cough Rails. The Sprocket genes is the principal gene of this setup. What it does is compile and save assets. And it's a, it is a simple process pipeline. Like you have a pipeline made of different processors. The Sprocket's key components are processors, transformers, components, directives, environment, manifest, and pipelines. I'm going to talk about one of each of those. So the processor is the most important component of Sprockets. It is any callable object that accepts an input and returns a hash of metadata. So this is one of one simple example of what is a processor inside Sprockets. It's just a lambda that receives an input is a hash and return another hash with the data and some metadata. So what this processor is doing is removing all the semicolons in the end of your JavaScript files because you don't need semicolons in JavaScript. So the input hash is consisted of those information, like you have the data of the assets itself you have the environment that is an instance of this process environment. You have the cache, the URI, the source path, load path, name, content type, and metadata. And you have to return another hash that is simpler than this one. The only required information is the data itself. So you have to return the data that is going to be used by the next processor in the chain. And you can also provide some metadata like all the required assets that you need to build that asset, links that you have to external assets, all the dependencies, the source maps of the assets, and also the mining type. Sprockets come with some built-in processors, like the most common are the SAS processor and the CoffeeScript processor, and the Version 4 of Sprockets also have a Babel processor to compile ECMAScript 6 files to JavaScript. One special kind of processor is called Bundle Processor. It is a processor that runs concatenated files 
render the individual files. This is how you register a processor in Sprockets. So I'm saying that to bundle all the assets together, I'm going to use the processor called bundle. And the same thing for CSS. What the bundle process does is to take a single file of assets, it prepends all the URL that uh, to the contents of these assets. I'm going to explain that later. Another kind of processor that you have are the transformers. They are simpler than the general processors because they know how to convert one file from one format to another format. Like we have the CoffeeScript processor that only transform CoffeeScript in JavaScript. And the implementation of any processor is the same, is any callable object. So the implementation of the CoffeeScript processor is something like this. You have a call method that receives an input and also return another hash. And what is important in this implementation is that what this processor does is actually compiling the data that was read from the file system to JavaScript and returning that data later to the next processor in the chain. We have also have the compressors, and the compressors are a special type of bundle processor. The difference between compressors in any other kind of processor is that it has a special way to to declare them and also to use. Like, this is the Ogrify compressor that takes any JavaScript code and compress and minifies to create few bytes when you are saving. And to use a compressor, you have a special API that you need to specify for each type of, you. we only have two compressors, the GS compressor and CSS compressors. So you have to specify which compressor you want to use when you are trying to compress JavaScript, for example. Sprox also has directives. Those are the most common things that you see in Rails applications. Like directives are the, those special comments that declare the bundles in the dependencies. This is the example of the directives being used I have an application GS file that depends on gcarry, gcarry y, and also in the user files. And also required all the files in the same tree. So this is the definition of my bundle, my application GS bundle. And to use that in the application, you have to register this bundle in the pre-compile configuration. This is the content of your config environment assets file. And this is saying that to generate my application, I have those two bundles, the application GS, the application CSS. You usually don't need to do that because this is the default of any Rails application. So by default, Rails define three, two items on the pre-compiled list. That is this strange lambda, that is saying that any file that's not CSS or GS is going to be pre-compiled, like images and MP3 and videos that you have in your assets folder. And also any file that's named application is going to be pre-compiled. There is a problem with this approach because it's not easy to understand what's going to pre-compile or not, and a lot of people had problem with this set up. So in Sprocket 3, we introduced a new kind of bundle that is called manifest file that is coming by default in any real life application. So this file is a simplification of that pre-compile lambda and configuration that is basically saying in a more declarative way which assets are going to be pre-compiled. So I'm saying that I need all the images inside the image folder, that I need all the GS files inside the JavaScript, all the CSS files inside style sheets, and I also can say that 
I want all the assets that are inside my engine. There are several directives by default in sprockets. The most common one is the required dire directive, but you can also use require self link depending on and depend on asset. Another object that is important in sprockets is the environment. And the environment is the main object inside the sprockets because it is exactly what has methods to retrieve and save assets to manipulate the load path and to register in processors. So this is how we usually use a sprocket environment. I'm telling in this code that I need to compile the application GS file. This is how the JavaScript include text works. And I can also specify new transformers, like I want to transform my SVG file to PNG using that transformer. So the environment always compiles the assets when you ask to. So every single asset that you ask to the environment is going to be pre-compiled on the fly. That's a problem in production because you don't need to always pre-compile the same file. So to fix that, we introduced another object that's called manifest. It's the same name of the configuration, but different thing. And the manifest is an object that logs all the contents of the assets that are pre-compiled inside the directory and also have a caching so you don't need to pre-compile every single time you access an asset. It's a really simple file that points assets path to fingerprint versions. Like when you do this in your views, you are calling JavaScript include tag with application. The manifest is responsible to get that name of the file that is used as the source of the script. So that file is basically a JSON file that points the, the path of the asset to the fingerprinted version of that asset. And there is also the another way that from the fingerprint version, you know what is the logical path, the aim type and digest of that file. This is used to, to cache invalidation, so every single time that you change your asset, it pre-compiles again. Spox already know how to do that, so you don't need to delete the cache at all. There are more components inside sprockets that I'm not going to talk about because they are also simple or not relevant to this talk like MIME types, dependency resolvers, the SOM suffix, bundle metadata reducers. They are mostly used by extensions of sprockets that you can make in, like gens. And another gen that I'm going to talk about is the sprockets rail gens. Like the name can point to you, it's a way to integrate sprockets to Rails application because sprockets are part of being used in Rails, can be used in any kind of application, even if you just agree in Elixir's application. And what sprockets Rails does is define helpers in your Ruby models. Like those two helpers are defined by sprockets Rails. And it also configures the Sprockets environment using the Rails configurations. Another thing that Sprockets Rails now does is check the precompile list because before we had the check, it was really hard to understand when your application have problems with your assets. So if you were pointed to wrong asset, like you have a typo in the name of the asset, you would you only see this problem in production when I asset was not going to be served because the name is wrong. But now you can see this beautiful error page that say you're trying to serve an asset that's not in the pre-compile list. Please fix that by adding this file to the pre-compile list or actually fix your typo. The other change that you have in this product setup is the size rails. 
And it does the same thing that this proxy layer does, that integrating the SAS processors with the Rails application. It generates, it defines the generators, like when you generate the scaffold, the application on CSS.SSS file is going to be generated by DGENS. It's also created an importer that knows how to handle globs and ERBs because the SAS processor by default doesn't know anything about ERB or even glob paths. So this is only possible if you are using the SAS rail gen because the first line the glob, the glob importer is, is not built in the SAS itself and the second one the ERB processor needs to be also declared in the genes. And it lets it configure the SAS processor. The ExecGS gen is a gen that was made to allow you to run JavaScript code inside your Ruby process. You may be asking why should I want to do that? Yeah, but one of the things that this is useful is that it uses the JavaScript environment that is available in your machine. So if you have a Windows machine, it's going to use the Microsoft Windows script host. If you have Node.js installed in your machine, it's going to use the Node.js. And there are a lot, several options of environments for JavaScript. And we need that because for instance, we want Sprockets, that is a whole program to compile CoffeeScript. We could write our own CoffeeScript compiling Ruby, but that would be at least inefficient because you would be duplicate work. So we actually use the same compiler that any JavaScript library use, that is the CoffeeScript compile. And this gen is what makes possible to us to run the same CoffeeScript compile inside the Ruby process. So this gen is used by the CoffeeScript gen to compile CoffeeScript and many others use that we have. And speaking of CoffeeScript, we have also the CoffeeScript rail gen that only is configured the generators. So if you don't need generators, you don't need the gen at all. It also defines a template handler, so you can serve CoffeeScript files inside your controller. And so how the assets are generated in development. Like, I explained all the genes, but how they work together in my Rails application. So say that you have a JavaScript include tag in your ERB file, your view, and like I showed before, what this is going to do in, in development and production is generate a script tag with a source that points to a query that is inside Sprocket itself. So your browser is going to do a get request in that URL, and that request is going to reach the rail server, and the Sprockets rail chains, we use the Sprockets pipeline called the bug to serve that asset that it was asked. The, the bug pipeline was registered like this. It's just an array of processors. And the only process that you have in that pipeline is the source map comment processor. This processor will generate an asset bundle and in the end, add a source map comment. It is a comment like this that is only pointing to the source map of that file. So to build the content of this file before adding the comment, Sprockets will use the default pipeline. And the default pipeline is declared like this. It's, we take the type, the file type of the file that is going to be served, and it's going to ask to the Sprockets environment what is the default processors for that type. So this is the implementation of the default processors for. It's really simple. It only takes 
the bundle processor registered for that MIME type. And if there is any processors registered, it's going to use that. In our example here, the bundle pipeline that's going to be used, we just precompile all the required files and mesh them all together. To compile each file, the self-pipeline is going to be used. The self-pipeline is just the pipeline that gets only one file, and it's registered like this. It's pretty similar to the default. And the implementation is also not so complete, complicated. Like, it's get all the push processors of that type, get all the transformers to that type, and later it gets the preprocessor for that type. In the end, it, it adds the file reader processor, that special kind of processors that reads the file from the file system. So, to explain better, I'm going to show a uh, image how that works. So we have the file reader as the first processor. Later we have the CoffeeScript processor and then the directive processor. So the file reader, we read the file from the file system and pass that data to the CoffeeScript processor that's going to process the CoffeeScript code and generate JavaScript code from that. And later, it's going to read all the directives we have inside that asset and include, include it in the metadata of the asset. So the processes always run in reverse order that they are registered. So first is the file reader, later the coffee script reader, later the directive processor. After this is done for each individual file, the brand processor will measure off them, and the result is going to be sent back to the browser. So it's a little bit complicated. A lot of things are being done, done in that single asset request. And you can imagine that this can be really slow in production. So the Key difference between development and production is that in production, all of this happens in the precompile test that we run in the deploy, and only a static asset is returned to your browser. You don't need to do all this work every single time. Now I'm going to show you how to extend these pockets. Like one of the things that we did in Shopify was creating new directives. In Shopify, we are using NPM and node modules to, to be included in our JavaScript setup. And we created a new directive processor that's defined an NPM directive. So to define a new directive, you need to define a method that is called process underscore something underscore directive. And this thing is the name of the directive that is going to be used. I'm not going to talk about the implementation of this. So after that's defined, I can change my default directive processor with my new directive processor that in this case is my NPM directive processor. And I can use this new direct directive in my JavaScript files now. Like, when I say that I need the Lodash NPM package, I only use this new directive. Another way to extend these pockets is, we also use that in Shopify, is sometimes we need to generate PNG image from SVG because PNG, SVG do, does not work in all the browsers. So instead of doing that manually every single time that someone's add a new SVG, we have a transformer that does that automatically for you at compile time. So we register a transformer from SVG to PNG. And in my manifest file, I can say, given that I have a SVG file, I'll compile a PNG version for it. And the implementation of this is really simple. We are using the R magic gen just to read the data, 
set the format to SPNG and later create the, the result of that PNG image. So this process is used in many Rails applications out there. It's inside every single new application that's generated. But like we are already know here, many users don't know it exists. Many users don't know how it works. So it's important to everyone to understand your tools, to document your understanding. This is what I'm doing here and to share with the community. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. Awesome. Uh, so you know the deal with the questions. You find Rafael around the stage.